Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> um, so happy Nauru's or spring equinox to those of who, you who are following those things. Uh, it is actually um, equal day and night as of a few hours ago. Uh, it's very appropriate that we're here in the planetary sciences space for that. Um, so uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here to this really phenomenal and momentous event, uh, the dedication and formal opening of Building 55, the Tina and Hamid Magadam building. So I'm Nergis Mabavala, and I'm the Dean of the School of Science here at MIT, and I'm really excited to welcome you all to this new space, which is to be the nexus for, the, uh, for MIT's Environmental Solutions Initiative, the MIT HUI Joint Program in Oceanography, Applied Ocean Science, and the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Science. The EAPS department has been led for the past 12 years by my colleague and friend, Rob van der Hilst, who is the Schlumberger Professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences. As most of you know, EAPS is housed right here, upstairs mostly, in this building and in, in a couple of other parts of campus, the Green Building. What you may not know is that the Green Building itself was dedicated just about 60 years ago, in 1964. When they broke ground in 1960, Julia Stratton was president of MIT, and the building's architect was none other than I.M. Pei, an MIT architecture alumnus, and the one who did the Hancock building, if you, if you look across the river as, as well. At 295 feet, uh, well, 312 if you include the Ray Dome, which many of us love, uh, this was the tallest building in, in Cambridge. And it held that record until all of the development around us here in, in, in Kendall Square, for the revitalization of Kendall Square. So Building 54 is a very cool building. It's the, the place to be anytime there's an event on, uh, on the river, including fireworks uh, on July 4th. Uh, but pretty much already by the 1990s, uh, issues had begun to sprout where the building was starting to not, not work very well. Uh, uh, and here we are, two decades later, and it's taken Rob's uh, commitment, leadership, and tenacity get, to get us to this beautiful, new, and renewed space as we see here, below us, above us, and around us. Uh, th that we are here celebrating the opening of the Mogadam building, nestled at the foot of the original IMP tower is a testament to Rob's vision and perseverance. And I, I can't uh, under, uh, overstate that. He not only made a compelling case for the new building with senior leaders, he passionately and persistently talked to everyone who would listen about the significance of creating a welcoming space that showcases and catalyzes the vital work of our students, faculty, and staff uh, that are uh, uh, what they're doing to expand our understanding of the natural world. He systematically managed to gain approval from senior administration to fundraise, and then, with the help of many of you who are in this room, succeeded in raising those funds. He really couldn't have achieved any of this without the generous support of so many donors and friends. On all of our behalf, including future generations of students who will touch this space, I thank you. So this remarkable space is already having impact. A couple of weeks ago, I was actually at a, at a lunch with a, a, a new uh, junior faculty member in EAPS who said, uh, we were talking about how the, the building is transformed, and she said, she said, everyone who walks into the Mogadam building gains two inches in height. I said, I could use that. Uh, they stand up taller and they smile more. Okay, and that was at, at that moment I I understood not only the, the importance of this but of Rob's vision in making this happen. Another lovely part of this renovation project is the naming of the, this newly renovated lecture hall, now known as the Dixie Lee Bryant Lecture Hall. For those of you who don't know, Dr. Bryant was the first person of any gender to receive an undergraduate geology degree from MIT in 1891. She was a dedicated geologist teaching as part of the faculty and head of the science department of what would eventually become the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. She later took a sabbatical to earn a PhD in Germany and was the first woman to receive a doctorate from that university as well. 
This is an important space on campus. I myself as a student have spent countless hours here, uh, sometimes to nefarious purposes, but we won't talk about that. Uh, it has served as a classroom, uh, sometimes painful, sometimes pleasurable. It has been an auditorium, it has been a performance hall, it has been something for everyone and for us at MIT and also so many who join us in, in, our, in our events here. So I'm delighted to be here celebrating with you today, but I also want to add one other thing. I'd be remiss in not uh, mentioning uh, that in addition to making the, the, this building ha happen uh, and building this vibrant interdisciplinary hub in the, in the heart of our campus, Rob also con has contributed to MIT's leadership in climate and environmental science. He has co-chaired the faculty uh, committee uh, that brought us MIT's uh, Climate Grand Challenges Initiative. He has launched a new joint major with Course, uh, course One uh, for an undergraduate degree, and he has also uh, raised countless funds to bring professors and students here to MIT, and including the state-of-the-art Rasmussen uh, Laboratories for Climate Research in Building 4. So please join me in honoring and thanking Rob for his extraordinary leadership of EAPS, for his energy and enthusiasm, uh, to see the Magadan building realized, for his wisdom and tenacity in memorializing Dixie Lee Bryant with this room, and for his help in advancing climate and environmental science at MIT. Rob, thank you. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce MIT's president, Sally Kornbluth. Welcome, Sally. Thanks so much, Nergis. Uh, so I'm very delighted to join you all in cel celebrating MIT's wonderful new home for climate and environmental research, the Tina and Hamid Mogadam Building. This project blossomed thanks to the generosity of several great friends of MIT, including the very first donors to the space, Georgia L. Baum and Mimi Jensen, who are here today as well. They've been long, steadfast EAP supporters. <laughs> and of course, creating the new Building 55 depended above all on the vision and generosity of Tina Gwatkin and Hamid Mogadam. On behalf of everyone here and of all the students, faculty, and research groups that will be served by these great new spaces, I want to express our great appreciation to every one of our donors for all that you have done to make this project real. So, you know, in the most literal sense, we're here to, to appreciate some wonderful new MIT real estate imagined in this reimagined lecture hall and in the, embodied in this reimagined lecture hall and the compelling contemporary appeal of Building 55, which we'll have a chance to experience a little bit more during today's reception. Now, as some of you know, Hamid is founder, chair, and CEO of Prologus, Prologus Corporation. The firm controls one billion square feet of warehouse space, which is critical to logistics operations all around the world. And I know that this audience will be especially pleased to learn that by equipping all those warehouse roofs with solar panels, Hamid has turned Prologis into the nation's second largest producer of solar energy. Um, which, so, it's like a utility company in and of itself. It's amazing. Uh, in short, he may know as much as any individual about the transformative power of real estate. In fact, in preparing for this event, I came across some words from Hamid that apply far beyond real estate and that capture what I believe makes this new space so significant. In Hamid's words, one thing holds true. If you look at any company or institution, culture is the only form of sustainable competitive advantage. Absolutely. And in other words, at a place like MIT, where our fundamental business is attracting and holding on to extraordinary talent, the single most th important thing we must pay attention to, our sustainable competitive advantage, is our culture. And so I think that's profound. I believe all of us can sense that the new spaces that we're here to celebrate are, in, are a direct investment in fostering the creative culture of this community. The culture of HUI and ESI and EAPS. 
the kind of culture that Rob has worked so hard to build in his 12 years as department head, so thank you. A culture of excellence, collaboration, and mutual inspiration, of openness, of respect, and of belonging, a culture of discovery and innovation, the culture that will fuel the leading edge science that will lead us to transformative new answers on climate change. So let, let me now offer just a few words about the MIT approach to the climate challenge. As you probably know that I'm a cell biologist, I'm neither a climate scientist nor an engineer, so disclaimer up front. But uh, in the fall of 2022, um, 2022, yeah, 20, oof, time goes fast. As soon as I announced that I'd accepted the president's job at MIT, several of my oldest friends spontaneously to call to say in effect, effect so you're gonna fix the climate, right? Uh, and once I got here, I heard the same sentiment over and over framed in, in local terms. Can you please help us organize ourselves to fix the climate? Everyone wanted to find a way for MIT to make a major global contribution. Everyone understood that MIT brought tremendous strength to the challenge. More than 20% of our faculty and research teams already do leading edge climate work, including many of you in this room. And everyone understood that in a place defined by its decentralization, focusing our efforts would require a fresh approach. After a decade in academic leadership, this was just the kind of challenge I relished, creating the structures and incentives to help talented people do much more together than they could do alone. So we have to direct that collective power to help deliver climate solutions to the world in time. Through intensive work, with more than 100 faculty members, Vice Provost Richard Lester developed the blueprint we recently announced for what we're calling the Climate Project at MIT. Richard led the faculty in defining the hardest climate problems where MIT could make the most substantial difference, what we call our climate missions. And there are six of these. First is decarbonizing energy and industry, uh, then one that will have lots of friends in this room, restoring the atmosphere, protecting the lands and the oceans, then empowering frontline communities, building and adapting healthy, resilient cities, inventing new policy approaches, and to make room for new insights that we really don't even understand yet, the sixth mission is called wild cards. So I'm sure there are many people in this room that have wild cards in their heads, and so please uh, keep thinking. Um, each mission will be a problem-solving community focused on research, translation, outreach and innovation that it will take to get emerging ideas out of the laboratory and deployed at scale. And of course, the entire project is grounded in the fundamental research that this community is known for. You can't translate nothing. We need new answers, and that depends on new science. Uh, in the words of Professor Susan Solomon, science is never sufficient to solve an environmental problem, but it's always, always necessary. So from the grounding in science, the climate project is unabashedly focused on outcomes in the spirit of MIT's Rad Lab, which developed the radar systems that helped win World War II. One of my predecessors, predecessors, Carl Taylor Compton, MIT president number nine, described the Rad Lab as the greatest cooperative research establishment in the history of the world. It achieved scientific miracles at record speed with an extraordinary sense of purpose. With the leadership and ingenuity of everyone at MIT, including the research community represented here, we aim for the climate project at MIT to do the same. So let me just finish with a little history. We just heard a little bit. Uh, as you know, the tower we're in now was completed in 1964. It was instantly iconic. We just heard it was uh, designed by the legendary I.M. Pei, class of 1940. It was only the actually the only tower on campus and by far the tallest building. So this came to define MIT's skyline and the signature sphere of the ray dome was the cherry on the top. In every way, this building stood out. But it turns out that if you stack hundreds of hardworking researchers in a 22-story building, it's actually a recipe for isolation in a way. Um, and this community devised lots of ways to pull people away from their work towards each other. I guess there's something called cookie hour, which sounds like a great uh, technical innovation. Um, but the building we're here to celebrate today does something else altogether. In its lightness, in its transparency, it calls attention not to itself, but to the people gathered inside. 
in its warmth, in its openness. It makes room for culture and community, and it welcomes in those who don't yet belong, which is why, as we take on the immense challenges of climate together, I could not be more grateful to all of you who have made sure that this, that this indispensable scientific community now has such a warm and inspiring new home. So thank you so much. And now, Hamid, I think you would like to say a few words. Thank you, President um, Kornbluth and Dean Mabalvala. Um, it's, uh, it's nice to be here on campus. Uh, it was only 51 years ago that I found myself in one of the residences near here, and uh, it was a very different campus. Today, we had the opportunity of actually touring some of the new facilities at uh, MIT, and boy, it's really been transformed, and I must say, for, for the better. So it's a very dynamic, um, high energy space, just to use uh, uh, an analogy that applies to the work that's being done here. Um, you mentioned uh, the importance of culture, and uh, one of the things that's unique about MIT is that it's a culture of meritocracy, and you have some of the brightest students and obviously faculty around the world that work on these really important problems. And I can't think of any problems that could be more important than the ones that we're tackling here today climate change and decarbonization. Our business, as, um, as um, President Kornbluth mentioned, is very focused on this issue because we have a pretty large foot footprint around the world and these buildings don't go away. So when you build one of them, they're around for 50, 100 years. So it's really important that we be sensitive to minimizing the impact of these facilities and actually turn the situation around from a net zero, net uh, carbon zero situation to a negative carbon situation, which is why we're so interested in, um, uh, in renewable energy. And the opportunity that we're pursuing is just scratching the surface, and I think it will be much larger down the road. And I don't think there needs to be a trade-off between good sound economics and return on investment and um, solving climate change problems. I don't know how this dichotomy started, but it's the wrong one. And I think the solutions that really work are the ones that actually make sense in a market economy. So, and, and it's happening. The costs of these renewable solutions are coming down, the technology is improving, and I think every day these investments are making more and more spen uh, sense. And honestly, we don't need all the subsidies that are available out there. I think the market can take care of those. So end of a political speech there, but, um, but uh, I'm really pleased to be here. I know some great uh, innovation and work will be done here, and uh, hopefully we can come back and celebrate all the successes that come out of this building. But um, as the dean mentioned, none of this would have happened uh, without Rob's efforts. He certainly had the vision. A lot of people have vision, but he had the persistence uh, to make the vision turn into reality. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Rob. Thank you. Thank you, Alfred. Well, well, what can I add to this? Thank you very much, Hamid, for the introduction, and also Nurgis and, uh, and Sally for your earlier words. Um, I, I hope that Nurgis is wrong in at least one thing, that I'm going to grow a few inches <laughs> in this space. <laughs> um, it's really fantastic to be here. This is the first uh, meeting, the first big meeting that actually I'm part of in this new uh, lecture hall. And if you just take a moment to look around, I mean, it's almost filled to, uh, to the last seat. It's just absolutely wonderful to, um, to be here. Um, this day has been long in the making, and there have been uh, many delays. And frankly, there was a time that I wasn't totally sure that we would be here in time to, uh, to celebrate this. And it was actually, in, as a matter of fact, only a few weeks ago that we got the certificate of occupancy uh, to actually be here. And so it was kind of a stressful moment. Uh, but now we are actually legal occupants of this, uh, of this space. And so we can uh, continue to, to celebrate. First of all, I would like to, to repeat the, the many thank yous to our donors. Um, you know, without them, um, it would not have been possible to do this. 
Uh, you see the names all here. Um, I'm not going to repeat all the things that have already been said about that, but I do ask for another round of applause uh, for these magnificent people. We did it, and we did it thanks to you. And uh, many of you are here, which I'm delighted about, and I'm looking forward to catching up with you after uh, for the reception. Um, not only for your tremendous generosity, but also for believing in the project and for your commitment to it, to the department, but I think also in a broader sense, as Sally already mentioned, um, for you know the, the, the vision that we had also to, to create kind of a, a climate hub here on, in the center of campus. And of course, that could not have been at a better time than the launch um, of the climate project that, that Sally already talked about. And it is really you know, a coincidence in a way that this vision started many, many years ago. And here we are in a beautiful confluence of uh, action and, and ideas. Um, I would like to thank a few other people that have not been thanked yet. I mean, the leadership. Um, this would not have been possible with the former leadership, the uh, President Emeritus Rafael Reif, who could not be here this afternoon. He hopefully can join uh, tonight. And also Marty Schmidt, the provost, the former provost, uh, for supporting this project. And also the many friends in the School of Science. Um, in particular, at that time, the former deans, Mark Kastner, uh, who sends his regards, who could not be here, and also Mike Sipser, who is here. Um, both of them have been very instrumental in you know, believing in the, in the project. And also, uh, not only from the point of view of space, but also indeed believing in the vision, in the power that space can have to foster culture and you know, to bring the community together in a way that I think uh, will happen and is already happening. Um, so that is really you know, fantastic, and I thank you for that. I also want to thank uh, Alex, Alex Mayen and his colleagues from uh, uh, AW Architecture uh, to create this absolutely beautiful space. Um, this place on campus, many of you remember that, especially the old timers and the alumni uh, who have been around. This used to be a very inhospitable, unwelcoming place. I don't want the word, use the word ugly, but uh, that's very close to how I would describe it. And it was anonymous. Uh, you would just arrive here. It was cold, windy probably one of the windiest places on campus, and you would quickly pass through it through the elevators and then you disappear in your corridors and never to be seen again until the end of the day you do the same thing in reverse order. So that didn't really add much to the community and we did have to resort to cookie hours indeed to, uh, to do that. And now here, it's a beautiful space, um, not only beautiful in the center of campus, I think it's you know, one of the most beautiful spaces, but of course I'm biased. Um, but it brings people together, um, as we've already seen, um, and it really invites people to stay here and to linger and, and, and uh, stay around. Actually, over the last couple of weeks, many people actually were here, uh, uninvited sometimes, uh, because they see empty space, empty desks, and they want to do Zoom rooms or even a place to crash for the night, and that happened here as well. Uh, but hopefully, of course, when we are making this place our home, that will, that will change. I also want to, uh, to, to thank the visiting committees, and in particular the chairs um, in the last uh, 12 years. Neil Papalardo, who is uh, hopefully uh, watching from home. So if so, Neil and uh, Jane, thank you very much, and I hope you're well. And also Ken Wong, who is here. Um, the visiting committees have played a tremendously important role in, of course, all range of things like oversight of the department, but also latching onto ideas and critical needs of a department and running that up back to the leadership of MIT. And that really has been um, really very important um, over the years. I also want to thank uh, MIT facilities, of course, campus planning and bar and bar construction for the determination in sometimes difficult times. This project kind of started at the time of COVID and we had you know, supply chains, we had personnel issues and all sorts of other things uh, and many other projects on campus. So that was not easy, uh, but here we are um, and I'm very happy to be here. Lastly, I would like to thank the EAPS community, uh, the department for your patience and your flexibility during the many months of construction and inconvenience and noise and vibration and you know I think we have rotated through three or four different uh, points of egress um, so we, people got lost where to go and but that's all past us 
Um, I also want to like uh, I also want to thank people from uh, staff um, that have been very instrumental in in making this possible. Um, all of you have been absolutely tremendous, um, and yet at the danger of missing out people, I do want to call out a few people. Um, Scott Wade, uh, somewhere here, who has really overseen the project from uh, from the faculty, from the department point of view, and has been tremendous. Um, and I also want to uh, thank um, Angela Ellis and. Where is Megan? Megan Coakley, and also Assistant Dean Elizabeth Chades uh, for development, for helping you know with the fundraising. Um, because without fundraising, this would not have happened. So I really think we owe all of them a good round of applause. <laughs> Nurgis and Sally talked already about the vision, and what I like about their words is that nobody talked about classrooms and office space, or labs for that matter. Even though that may have been the original driver for more space, it is indeed the culture, the community that was really important, and that is, a, I think, what the legacy of this building is going to be. So when I first became department head, now 12 years ago, um, actually building spaces or expanding the footprint of EAPS was not my priority. I was really focused on fellowships, uh, on you know building community in, in, in various ways. Um, but Mark and, and Marty came to me, and I still remember that, and he said, okay, the administration wants to do something for EAPS. Um, and it is true that you know EAPS, uh, the department, or the, the, the building in particular, uh, has suffered from decades of neglect. I wouldn't even call it benign neglect, but it was neglect. Um, and there was a lot of issues with lab space that we couldn't expand in this building. There was a lot of deferred maintenance. And so it was certainly true that there was a need to do something, but I was very skeptic. Uh, many efforts had been made since the beginning of the 90s, and it all resulted in frustration. And I thought, okay, I'm not going to do this and being frustrated. I'm going to focus on community. But of course, building is community in, uh, in many different ways. So I thought, okay, if they're behind me, then I'll take this opportunity to, to get it going. But of course, the project was much more about space, and um, it was very much about identity and, and pride and, and community. It was also about you know, making the big building that we love to hate just more livable and, and more welcoming. Because we do actually like this building, even though it's stratified and not conducive of community, but nobody wants to leave here. Uh, but we can make it better as what we are doing right now. Um, and also, we wanted to enhance the visibility of the department uh, across campus and the connections across campus. And of course, in the context of the climate project in particular, you know, this is a wonderful moment to do that. So in a way, my vision at the time was uh, threefold. And it's not about the physical space per se, even though it is very, very welcome and it's beautiful. Um, but it wanted to improve the quality of the community, uh, where so many of us, you know, spend so much time in here. And it is, you know, fantastic to have a more welcoming space. As one of my colleagues put it, uh, we already heard the anecdote from Nurgis about growing taller and smiling. One of my colleagues put it, say, well, now when I come in this space, I feel respected by this space. And I think that's a very powerful remark. And you come here, you feel like, okay, it's warm, you feel like coming home. And so that is already mission accomplished right there. Second, um, I wanted to create a hub at the center of campus uh, that enhances the synergies between stakeholders working on climate, environment, and earth system problems. Um, and with the objective, of course, to, for us, we do a lot of fundamental research, but of course, we all know that you know, fundamental research is very important. Um, Sally gave the quote of, of Susan Solomon. But also we have to connect indeed to applications and solutions. And how better to do that at MIT to cut across and connect to the outside world or inviting some of the major stakeholders for us inside the building. And that is indeed the Environmental Solutions Initiative, uh, Woods Hall, the joint program of Woods Hall, who already had headquarters here on the eighth floor and offices and, and administrative space. Um, so that's now all in the same building. And also the first, the, the main class of Terrascope, one of the MIT first year um, um, teaching or education initiatives is going to be done here in this building. So it's going to be absolutely wonderful. And I very much look forward to seeing how those synergies um, are going to build up. And third, 
is also about visibility. Everybody that's come to this place here, this particular lecture hall, and that's basically, I don't think I exaggerate, all the undergrads of MIT, sooner or later, come to this space. And instead of going through the wind, they now go through very beautiful space that we're gonna make our home, and there will be all sorts of beautiful visuals. And so this is a great opportunity for us to actually showcase what we do, all the exciting research that we do, to an enormous cohort of students and also visitors uh, to MIT. So I think this will change EAPS forever. And I'm internally grateful for everybody uh, here in this room and at home uh, who have made it possible. So thank you very, very much. And I would now like to introduce uh, Rolad Buk, uh, a graduate student in EAPS studying planetary dynamics. Not about climate, but also very exciting. Uh, her work investigates the interaction between solar system planets and their satellites. And she will share with all of us the perspective from the students on this new building. Rolad, welcome. Thank you, Rob, for the kind introduction. It's a privilege to address our distinguished audience today on this milestone occasion, and I'm truly honored to represent the hardworking students of the Green Building who are very excited for the journey ahead in the Tina and Hamid Mogadam Building. I still vividly remember the moment I received my acceptance to the planetary science program here at MIT. And filled with anticipation, I immediately turned to Google to catch a glimpse of what the building I'll be working in looks like. <laughs> and as I scrolled through the images of the green building, I couldn't help but feel a little bit disappointed. While the architecture was undeniably unique, it's, it felt a little bit outdated and lacked the modern aesthetic I had imagined. Nevertheless, I remained extremely excited to join this prestigious institution. Upon my arrival in the US in 2021, I recall catching sight of the Green Building as I crossed the Charles River for the first time. Despite its iconic status to Cambridge, I sensed an openness to change. And it wasn't long after I heard about the construction project that was being planned. When it began, every day I'd walk by the construction site, eagerly waiting for its completion. With time, entering and exiting the department wasn't always smooth sailing as we had to navigate through the work zones and endure the accompanying noise, but we knew it was going to be worth it. As the project evolved and the building began to take shape, we as students were very excited. We constantly found ourselves sharing thoughts and opinions about the new building and particularly appreciating the modern aspect it adds to our department. We looked forward to the day when we would walk into our new space filled with anticipation and excitement for the possibilities that it held. And now being here, it feels incredibly fulfilling. As students, we keenly grasp the significance of this moment. The Mogadam building is not just a change of scenery. It embodies our collective commitment to make a positive impact on the world. It offers a place where we come together to share ideas, work on projects collaboratively, and motivate each other to achieve greatness. In fact, community coffee breaks are already taking place on Tuesday morning in this new space, and this is only the beginning of the vibrant activities to come. What excites us most about this new building is the boundless opportunity that it presents. It is a platform for our research to gain more visibility, both within campus and outside, inspiring others to join us in our quest to understand, protect, and preserve the planet. Finally, I'd like to take a moment to express how proud I am being part of EAPS, and I'm certain that my colleagues share the same feeling. And with this new addition to our department, we stand even prouder with an MIT campus. As we embark on this new chapter, I'd like to extend heartfelt thanks to all the supporters who made this possible for us students. We honor the vision behind this new building, and we wholeheartedly commit ourselves to the pursuit of a brighter and more sustainable future. Thank you.
Thank you so much. And I really hope indeed that all these expectations will be fulfilled in the next uh, years, but I have no doubt about it. Um, talking about the noise and the construction, um, the only unfortunate thing is that, you know, after all we have gone through over the last couple of years, this is not the end of it. I mean, if you've walked around, I mean, it's still a mess on campus. Uh, East Campus is being, being renovated, so we are still in the construction site for maybe another year or so to come. Um, and then it will, famous last words, it will be absolutely beautiful. Um, and they will also then fix up the landscaping around it. Um, of course, we have seen there be a beautiful garden in front of it. They will do the planting uh, probably in the next month or so. So we are only seeing the beginning of what is uh, going to be an absolutely beautiful environment. We have the next slide, please. So what I would like to do now is to, to really set the tone for what's coming next. I mean, the three speakers that come after me and to talk a little bit more about what we actually do here in, uh, in the department without going into uh, to any detail, of course. Um, but first, I thought it would be interesting to, uh, to recap a little bit of the history because for geology in particular, the history of MIT um, is actually very interesting. It, it, it really goes all the way back to the very beginning because the founding president, uh, William Barton Rogers, was a geologist. And so when he founded MIT in 1861, uh, already from the very beginning, geology was one of the handful of, of majors that, that was being offered. Um, with a different course number. Of course, we at MIT, we love course numbers, we love building numbers. Uh, this was course four, uh, but then it progressed to uh, became, become course 12 in 19, uh, 1890. And indeed, as Nurk has already mentioned, uh, Dixie Lee Bryant was the first student graduating from course 12, actually in 1891. Um, so it's, um, she's a very important person for our, for our history and we are very proud that this lecture hall um, is going to be named after her. Um, and then of course, fast forward 60 years ago was uh, the Green Building, 1964. And now here we are here to celebrate uh, the Magadam Building uh, number 55. Um, all of you from MIT talking about numbers of buildings, I know it doesn't make sense to go from 54 to 55 in the way that you might think. In the MIT system, it's a bit of a puzzle, but here we are, and we are very proud of building 55. On the, if, oh sorry, if you go one back, right. On the top line, uh, what you see here is not course 12, but is actually meteorology and later also physical oceanography. Um, that started in a different department in, uh, in course 16 in aeronautics and astronautics uh, with, with Rosby in uh, 1928. And that converged in 1983 to go together with earth and planetary sciences to basically create EAPS as we know it today. So actually tomorrow we are celebrating the 40th anniversary of the department proper. Next slide, please. So at EAPS we seek to answer big questions with far-reaching implications for the sustainability of human life on the planet. Um, Rola said it more eloquently even than this, uh, but that is really what brings us together. And the way we do that, in the next slide, please, is really through a portfolio of cross-disciplinary research. Could I have the next slide? Or can I? I can. Thank you. Um, so we do that through very curiosity-driven, exciting portfolio of research that really spans across many different themes that are seemingly disconnected, but if you think about it, they're all very much connected, uh, in particular in the science that we do here. Earth, planets, climate, life. Um, of course, climate is connected to life. It's happened on, a, on, on our Earth. Uh, we try to understand planets and, and the climate and the atmosphere on planets, and we can ma all make crosslinks across them. Next slide, please. And in Earth, we do a lot of field work. We basically roam um, all the corners of, uh, of the globe. Mark Kessner, he always calls it, called us the Indiana Joneses of, uh, of the School of Science, and in many ways, that's true. Uh, we like to travel and, uh, and sample remote places. Planets, the next slide, um, brings us, of course, even further afield. And we make observations from satellites, or sorry, from telescopes on the lower right here, which is in uh, Tenerife, a telescope uh, run by um, Julian de Witt 
um, actually owned by MIT. We're also very much involved in, in uh, missions to Mars, for example, in the lower left. We have one of the rover missions. We study planet, you know, the magnetic fields on the top right. We study surfaces on Titan and Mars and other planets. And of course, there is again what we know and have learned from Earth. We can uh, apply directly to other planets. We can also see things at other planets that we have not seen here. And that really makes us understand our own systems better. And the next slide, please, is climate. Uh, that's the third big theme that many of us are working on. Uh, we have talked about it already a lot here, but that really brings many of us together to understand that because of the urgency of the problem. And finally, life, and in particular life in the way we study it here, the origin of life and the co-evolution of life and the environmental system and the Earth itself. So it's very cross-cutting, the research that we do. The next slide, please. Not only within the departments, uh, we like to work together. It's one of the distinguishing strengths, I think, of EAPS uh, compared to other departments in the, in, in the world, maybe even. Uh, but also we make use of the, uh, of the environment. I mean, we are an integral part of the DNA of MIT. And MIT is a wonderful area for cross-disciplinary research. People are excited about what other people do, about the science, about solutions. Uh, the boundaries between units are very porous, and the only enemy that we have is time. Everybody's too busy. But apart from that, it is an absolutely wonderful environment to be in. Either to expand the horizons of the curiosity-driven research that we do by collaborating with colleagues in other departments, but also um, we want to bring the solutions that we have, or the understanding that we have, closer to solutions. And that is also why we really look forward to working with the Environmental Solutions Initiative and uh, the joint program in, uh, in Woods Hall that we have already be part of, of course, for many decades. Um, but also through the first year learning community um, through Terrascope. And it's my distinct pleasure to invite now uh, David McGee, the Associate Department Head of EAPS. And he's also the director, has been for six, seven years now. Eight or nine, <laughs> time flies. Terrascope um, has been you know, one of the, the, the jewels uh, in terms of undergraduate education for EAPS. Uh, our predecessor, the predecessor to David McGee, uh, Sam Bowring, many of you remember him. He was a devoted leader for Terrascope and I was delighted when David McGee took it over and uh, bring it to the next level. So David, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rob, and uh, I want to join with all the previous speakers in thanking everyone who made uh, today possible. Um, so I'm going to say a little bit, let me go back here, about what Terrascope is and uh, first, and then I'll tell you why I'm here, what our connection to the new building is. So there are three central things about Terrascope that I think you should know. The first is that each year we choose a different real-world problem that has to do with climate and sustainability that became, becomes the focus of our classes and activities throughout the year. And we engage first years in deeply exploring that problem, proposing solutions, working on engineering project, projects that have to do with it, communicating about it, um, doing a deep dive into this problem. Um, while the topics change from year to year, they all ha have the commonality that scientific and engineering expertise is absolutely essential for them but it's not sufficient. All of them, for all of them, effective solutions must be built upon an understanding of people's lived experience of the problem, upon considerations of policy and economics and social context, upon ethical reasoning, and they all force students to grapple with the fact that any potential response involves trade-offs. There is no right answer to any of the problems that students examine. The second hallmark of Terrascope is a really strong focus on student-led learning. In our classes, students own not just the final project or the final, final proposal that they present at the end of the term to a panel of external experts, but also the process that gets them there. We believe in the power of giving students the reins, giving them the ability to build their sense of agency and confidence, to, to test their skills in working with teams and communicating between teams and breaking down problems that seem initially too big to solve. We give them a whole lot of support along the way from undergraduate teaching fellows, MIT alumni who show up to 
give them advice along the way. But at the end of the term, they really feel like this, they own what they are presenting. In the words of one of our recent alums, in Terrascope, there's not an awful lot of teaching, but there's a humongous amount of learning. Finally, we believe in the power of connecting beyond MIT. We've always sought ways for our first year undergraduates to learn from expertise outside the academy through our classes and through our spring break field experiences. In a little bit less than 48 hours, we'll be leaving with 30 undergraduates to go for spring break down to Puerto Rico to learn about community-based initiatives in accessing sustainable and reliable electrical power, where students will be meeting with government leaders and citizens and nonprofit leaders and getting a rich understanding of the context of the problem that simply is not available to them unless studying it from a classroom in Cambridge. More recently, these connections outside of MIT have led us to invite others into the rich experiential opportunities that our classes offer, as we are now co-teaching our spring design class with Dinek College and the Navajo Nation, and this year with the University of Puerto Rico and Ponce, with students at those universities joining with our students on teams, working together in person during the first week of the term, and then again over spring break. Um, we're really excited for this uh, opportunity for our students to learn from their students and for the students to learn how to work together. So why am I here? In Terrascope, we're really excited about the Mogadam building for two reasons. The first is that our classes are relatively large, about 50 or 60 students, but they require flexibility. If you walked in, you're gonna see something that looks much more like on the right-hand panel here. Most of MIT's class, finding a flexible classroom that can fit that many people at MIT is a surprisingly hard problem. Most of the large uh, classrooms for classes like that look like what's on the left. The classrooms downstairs give us the capacity and the flexibility that we need, and then we think many other instructors around MIT will, will welcome to uh, build lar large project-based student-centered teaching classes. Um, second, EAPS is a founding, member, founding uh, partner of Terrascope, along with our colleagues in civil and environmental engineering. And across the last 24 years of Terrascope, one of the only things that's remained constant has been support from EAPS and the fact that the, the, the foundational class of Terrascope, the fall class 12000, has been an EAPS class that has received support from EAPS faculty and TAs. I don't think this is an accident. I think all of us who were schooled in geology have, the, have had the experience of being taken out by a professor to stare at an outcrop, this messy real world thing, before we felt we were ready. And we remember how powerful a learning experience that is. And that is very much integral to the experience of, of, that students get in Terrascope. Um, and so, and, and it's fantastic to be in the same building at last, uh, to better connect our students to their, their vital work being done in EAPS and to better connect EAPS to interdisciplinary problem-based education. So, oops, I went forward, sorry about that. Um, so I, I wanna close here by putting on a different hat, and that's my hat as the, uh, the chair of the Climate Education Working Group here at MIT. In a period of such rapid, widespread climate and environmental change, we feel that this charge set out in MIT's mission is more vital than ever. And we've been thinking about how to meet the same by focusing on preparing our students to respond to the climate, environmental, sustainability challenges that we face and that they will face throughout their lives, and the opportunity that these challenges present to envision and build a world that works not just for us, but also for future generations and for the planetary system we're a part of. To this end, we are preparing specific proposals to ensure that all students gain an understanding of the Earth system while they're here at MIT, and opportunities to engage in classes and in educational experiences in which they engage with problems rather than disciplines. So we're seeking to move climate and environment and sustainability education uh, to, to create some space at the heart of MIT's uh, educational program. And so we're thrilled to now have physical, literal space uh, at the heart of campus for learning, gathering, engagement, and discovery focused on the health of the planet and the people on it. So. Thank you very much. And now I'm gonna hand it over to John Fernandez, the director of the Environmental Solutions Initiative. John. Thank you, David. And also from me, thank you to everyone that's made this space and Building 55 possible. Um, I'm the director of the Environmental Solutions Initiative. The Environmental Solutions Initiative was founded by EAPS professor Susan Solomon. Um, in 2014, 
I became director in 2015, and I've worked to grow the initiative in service to the MIT community and external partners across many topics and disciplines. Today, we're well aware that the grand environmental challenges, climate change, biodiversity loss, expanding pollution, scarce resources, especially water and energy, are the sources of great human suffering, and this century is still young. We're projected to add a little more than 20% to the human population in less than 30 years, and reaching net zero emissions by 2050 will require an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So while we know a great deal about how the Earth works, there's still more to learn to ensure an environmentally positive and humane decarbonization trajectory. We in the ESI started our journey with the charge to work across all departments and schools at MIT, and we've been steadfast, steadfast in fulfilling that charge. We've supported the faculty of almost every department and certainly every school with research and curricular grants, convenings, symposia, and more. Pictured here are EAPS professor Paula Gorman and civil and environmental engineering professor El Fatih El Tahir, two recipients of an early ESI research seed grant. We've also spawned our own in-house research efforts through our programs, natural climate solutions, mining and circular economies, cities and climate change, arts, AI and climate, and climate justice. The continued engage engagement with EAPS keeps the ESI grounded in the fundamentals. Understanding the connection between natural capital, for example, metals and minerals for a low carbon economy, and the natural carbon sink of the biosphere is what I mean by the notion that planning for a decarbonized future is dependent on understanding how large scale planetary systems interact with and are affected by human activities. Our programs are all beholden to the latest knowledge created in EAPS, as well as civil and environmental engineering and Department of Urban Studies and Planning and many other departments at MIT and beyond. Having the space below us, Building 55 to the right, and this wonderful space, um, especially the open public space on the first floor that we will all enjoy later, will allow us to develop a center of interest for the entire MIT community as all of MIT considers the challenge of aligning human systems with the aspiration for a sustainable planet. And alongside research, it may be argued, in fact, I've argued this often, that maybe the most durable solution that we can offer is the very best education to our undergraduates and graduate students who then become agents of change for a better world. The ESI created and manages the undergraduate minor in environment and sustainability open to all undergraduates. We've also worked extensively to infuse environmental subject matter throughout the curriculum, including the general institute requirements. And we're now deeply engaged in creating cohorts of professors across departments to collaborate in curricular development on a wide array of topics related to sustainability and climate change. All of this is intended to serve the central mission of the ESI and MIT, solutions and service to the world. We've also been doing that through our extensive communications assets, including the MIT Climate Portal. Please visit it if you haven't, um, mitclimate.edu. Uh, visit that portal, as well as the Climate Primer, developed in partnership with EAPS professor, Dr. Carrie Emanuel, and a popular podcast called TIL Climate, Today I Learned Climate. Look that up, it's, it's very popular. We're getting huge listenership. We also get our students engaged well beyond the classroom in a variety of ways. One way is our rapid response group, which matches students with external partners to do targeted work on important climate and environmental topics. Here, undergrads on the right there in Peru, working on a solar powered drone for biodiversity monitoring. I will conclude by stating my expectation that being here in this space, in, the, in this space and in Building 55, home now to the ESI, will do wonders for expanding our ability to engage deeply across the School of Science and, of course, the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences. And now I'd like to uh, welcome up here, first, Norham Bayoumi, 
ESI research scientist to tell you about the ESI program, Natural Climate Solutions, and then after Norhan, Rob Fattel, PhD candidate in civil and environmental engineering and researcher, will tell us about the ESI Mining and Circular Economies program. Norhan. Thank you so much, John. Um, so, uh, this, no, it's not this one. This one. It's not maybe the other one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, the Nature Climate Solution Research Programs works with communities in the indigenous groups and Afro-descendant communities in the Global South to develop technical solutions that aims to enhance and enrich the preservation of the natural ecosystem, but also the sustainable use of resources. Uh, we've been focusing on the Global South specifically because it hosts a large uh, amount of irrecoverable carbon sinks and biodiversity hotspots, and it's also home for a number of uh, vulnerable communities. At the same time, the Global South is challenged by a number of issues, such as biodiversity loss, illegal mining, deforestation, which pushing these regions to the tipping points, uh, reaching the critical tipping points. How we have been uh, working with these uh, communities uh, through a research-based uh, a, a place approach where we have been driven to identify the needs of the local communities uh, through a listening tool that we developed in the first years of research. And right now, our research is focusing on key, uh, two key areas. The first one is the climate risk monitoring and biodiversity management. Uh, the picture you see on the screen is part of our biodiversity, uh, uh, the climate risk uh, monitoring uh, research projects, where we have worked with the local community to uh, develop uh, machine learning solutions uh, that would help assess uh, landslide risks. So we have been working in the city of Mokowa, uh, which uh, have suffered from landslide in 2017 that killed around 300 people and uh, displaced more than thousands of people located in that, in that city. And uh, through this collaboration, we uh, aim to build the technical capacity with the local community, such as training local pilots to use uh, area robotics like drones to collect data, and also working with local researchers uh, to develop a machine learning approach that would help uh, predict landslide susceptibility in these regions that could act as an early warning system. And uh, the second piece of our research also, uh, keep going forward, uh, goes to the uh, biodiversity management, which is uh, focusing on urban biodiversity management. Uh, so we're focusing on Leticia and Kibdu. These are two cities uh, in Colombia that are an, in the heart of the Amazon forest. And through this uh, research project, we developed a practicum in the School of Urban Planning called Biodiversity and Cities, where we worked with our student, with the local community on the ground to develop recommendations and strategies for the local community that will help uh, them foster, but also uh, enrich the surrounding uh, urban system. Uh, we are very excited to be moving to the Apes building because that could drive a large collaboration with the Apes uh, faculty, uh, students, community, and researchers to drive more impactful solutions in critical regions like the Global uh, South. So now I'm going to hand it over to Robert. <laughs> Oh boy, I need to figure out how this thing works. Ah, okay. Hi everyone, my name is Rob Fattel. I'm a PhD student in civil engineering, as well as a student lead of our program on mining and the circular economy at ESI, which is a really special program because it's actually the only bridge between MIT research and the mining industry, as well as the communities impacted by it. And this comes at a particularly important time when the demand for the metal inputs of clean energy technologies is escalating at an unprecedented rate. And so our program uh, aims to make sure that these resources are extracted responsibly with the best technology and that the demand for uh, extractive activities is lowered by alternate sources of recycling and whatnot. And so towards these aims, we're hosting a conference with the International Council of Mining and Metals this coming September, focused on three themes of reducing, reusing, and reimagining uh, mine tailings or waste. Some of you may not know this, but 
for instance, the copper in your phone uh, accumulates about 90 to 100 times the volume of waste as the actual you know, metal that goes into your phone. And that has huge consequences for the communities nearby and the environment. Um, and so that's actually what my research is about. Uh, this is really just decoration, but we're monitoring these large waste heaps uh, using remote sensing and some traditional ground instrumentation, which directly ties into work being done at EAPS because it connects to issues related to water quality, impacts on biodiversity, and things related to sediment and, and geotechnics, which you guys have heard a little bit about before. Um, so some of these images, this is me at the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers, as well as my professor, Andrew Whittle, presenting his work on, uh, as an expert witness for a, a tailings dam failure that happened in Brazil. Um, and so we've also engaged with industry. Uh, for instance, Vale, which is a major Brazilian mining company that some of you might recall had a, a really horrific disaster in 2019. Uh, and professors uh, Roberto Rigabon, and oh, who's actually covered by that, I'm sorry, uh, and Andrew Whittle, my advisor, uh, went and trained 60 professionals on ways to improve operational management uh, and sustainability within their business, which is a huge success. And we're also in the process of uh, negotiating with a company to work on a domestic mining project to convene stakeholders that are within the community, the federal government, and, and the mining industry to make sure that these, these activities happen equitably and, and, uh, and responsibly. Um, so with that, I think I'll turn it over to John again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Norhan and Rob. Um, so we're, we're thrilled to be now physically adjacent to EAPS. We could go on and on with the ESI programs and how we relate to EAPS and how we've done, but the timekeeper would be very upset with me. So, so we're, we're going to move on. Um, and um, I'm now uh, introducing uh, EAPS professor Michael Follows, the director of the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute Joint Program. Thank you, it's a really a great pleasure to be part of this event. So I very much appreciate the opportunity. Oh yes, I very much appreciate the opportunity. You told me that earlier, but there we go. So the uh, MIT Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution Joint Program in uh, Oceanography, Applied Ocean Sciences and Engineering, right? That's it, we call it the Joint Program for short. So uh, often people will call it HUI. Uh, so uh, it's the marriage of uh, MIT's intellectual uh, atmosphere and, and uh, capability with uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution where there's more than a thousand oceanogra oceanographic specialist scientists, access to the sea, uh, ocean vessels, engineering opportunities. And so it's the marriage of the two in a graduate uh, training program. Um, uh, and uh, it, I think it provides a very unique opportunity for graduate students in oceanography. The program has been uh, uh, operating now for 56 years, I believe. There's more than 1,100 uh, uh, graduates of al alumni of the program around the world. Uh, uh, there are currently about 150 uh, PhD uh, candidates in the program. Uh, and uh, every year, about six naval officers join us uh, to gain a master's degree, which they bring back to their professional careers. Um, as you can see in this picture, this is one cohort uh, of a recent cohort out on their first uh, 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 ocean research expedition on their sailing vessel. In the background, you can see the Neil Armstrong, which is uh, a top class ocean research vessel, which is managed by Woods Hole. Many of these students will work on that platform during their career uh, as a graduate student and beyond uh, doing important oceanographic research. So why, why, why do we have this program? Well, why do we uh, study the oceans? The ocean, there's many, many answers to that, but I'll just mention a couple of things. The ocean is an incredible uh, component, an important component of the carbon, of the carbon cycle and the climate system. Uh, most of the uh, heat that's accumulated on the planet in uh, the last 100 years, say, is actually stored in the ocean. About a third of the fossil fuel CO2 that we emit uh, ends up going into the ocean on an annual basis currently. The oceans 
uh, an enormous ecosystem that we exploit to its maximal extent through fisheries and in other ways, for example. And so to uh, address challenges associated with these uh, issues and questions, we have to really truly understand the dynamics of the system, how it works fundamentally, and be able to quantitatively and mechanistically uh, understand uh, uh, the, how it works and think about what could be happening in, in other climates, in future climates. Uh, it's an incredibly interdisciplinary um, uh, uh, area of study. Uh, the, these are the five uh, disciplines which we break the program down into. You'll see at the top, ocean science, applied ocean science and engineering. Engineering is a very key uh, uh, aspect of the program. How do we observe the oceans with modern uh, platforms? How do we improve the ways we look at the oceans? It's just one of the ways that engineering is providing many uh, solutions for. Uh, physical, biological, and chemical oceanography, marine geology, and geophysics are the five. These are the five departments at Woods Hole. That are 150 current students are associated each with one of those, and they're also associated uh, with a department at MIT. And because of this very interdisciplinary nature, there are six departments at MIT: four in School of Engineering, two in the School of Science that participate uh, in this program. So it's a very interesting cross-campus interdisciplinary area of research and our students benefit both from the intra and inter-campus opportunities uh, afforded by this uh, collect connect collective, connective program. Just a quick view of what some of our students might be working on at any one time. Uh, on, the, on, on your right, yeah, sorry, my left, your right, uh, you can see uh, a joint program student and an engineer from Woods Hole deploying an in, a robotic glider that intelligently works its way up the east coast of uh, 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 monitoring the ocean, but uh, doing so in a way that is self-guided a little bit to, do, to uh, op optimize the data you get. A recent graduate of the program uh, went down to study the ecosystems of, at hydrothermal vents thousands of meters down at the seafloor in the Alvin, uh, uh, a remotely uh, uh, a, rem a remote uh, manned vehicle that uh, is operated out of Woods Hole. Our students are involved in important climate-related uh, research. On the left is an image. Uh, that a, a student took who was studying sea ice in the Nordic seas and the role of warm waters uh, melting them from below. And students in the program are involved in research studying the rapid changes we're now seeing in the physical environment, the chemical environment, and the biological systems of the Arctic region and around the, the globe. On the right is one of our Navy students in civvies uh, studying the dynamics of sargassum, seaweed, that floats around in the Sargasso Sea. And this is a current uh, focus of interest from a point of view of carbon dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide recovery or removal. Uh, I shouldn't forget that uh, theory, computation, and modeling is a very important synthetic part of the program. Here's Mara Freilich, a recent graduate, now Professor at Brown. Uh, and she worked, for example, on thinking about how smaller scale features in the ocean that move heat and chemicals and biological entities around in important ways. What's their integrated effect on larger scales? These scales are not resolved in current climate models, but they're important for large scale questions. Just to remind us as well, on the right, uh, our students are very motivated by uh, bigger problems beyond the ivory tower of research. And many go into careers uh, beyond that, and many are contributing beyond that. For example, groups of uh, students go to the uh, UN climate conferences, the COP uh, meetings, and uh, man the uh, ocean pavilion uh, and provide their expertise to the wider community on the oceanographic side. Just uh, to finish off then, so what's the connection here with EAPS? Well, of course, EAPS is very integral to all this. Each of the 150 odd students in the program has uh, an affiliation with a department at MIT, even if their primary lab is at Woods Hole. 
And more than two thirds of those students are affiliated with EAPS, and that makes sense because this is where a lot of Earth science and oceanography and related research is happening. Also, as Rob has mentioned, uh, it's been very generous of EAPS over the years to provide the administrative space for the joint program, MIT end of administration, and to provide workspaces for the peripatetic students who all the students spend their first couple of years here taking classes, even if they're going to be based at Woods Hole long term. Many students are visiting occasionally, and it's EAPS who's providing the space for these students to work on a day-to-day -day basis. And so we, as a program, are certainly going to benefit and are very excited to benefit from the new Mogadam building, and we're very excited to be part of this uh, community, uh, especially the opportunities to uh, use the new spaces for connecting across the campus, or when our colleagues come from Woods Hole to connect with them, uh, and also to connect in a much more informal uh, and uh, hopefully inspirational way with our colleagues in EAPS and from the wider MIT community. And so thank you for these new spaces and all the investment in the joint program that the department has given us over the years. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mick and um, John and David. Well, this gave you a little bit of an idea how interconnected the, the science is that we do and uh, ways how we want to connect to, on the one hand, the far oceans of the world uh, through our friends in the joint program, uh, but also through um, the education mission of, of Terrascope and the work that uh, ESI is doing. Um, I'm really delighted to see all these connections, and of course, you know, I hope to, uh, you know, to create this space uh, to enhance them. I very much believe in people. I believe in physical adjacencies, and so bringing all the groups together, um, I'm really excited to see what uh, will happen and how we look back on this particular moment, say five years from today. So let me finish by thanking Tina and Hamid again for your fantastic generosity to making all of this possible. And all of you for being here, and I invite you all to go down to the uh, atrium uh, for reception. Thank you very much, and I'll see you down there. <laughs>